Welcome to the Fall 2021 MJC Speech Night. In tonight's event, students from the MJC Speech and Debate Team will offer a showcase of their competitive events, including limited preparation, platform speaking, oral interpretation, and debate. Before we begin, I want to thank everyone in the Communication Studies Department and the Arts, Humanities, and Communications Division. I also want to thank all of the students on the team who invest incredible time and effort in this activity and all of you watching from home. Enjoy the show. Today, it is my privilege to introduce you to the MJC Speech and Debate Team. Joshua Bruce, Brandon Castro, Nikki Daniels, Kylie Duncan, Israel Houston, Michelle McKee, Jared Medeiros, Sierra Pangelinen, Christina Peterson, Alexis Rangel, D'Angelo Sanchez Johnson, Ricardo Sequeira, and Sandra Sullivan. The first event is impromptu speaking. This is a limited preparation event. In this speech, the speaker is given a set of random prompts and has only two minutes to prepare a five minute speech. Despite the time crunch, the speaker is still expected to be organized, produce substantive content, and deliver the presentation with style. Tonight's impromptu speaker will be Israel Houston. I start my prep time. Motion major part of it. Around the year 1000, a polymath by the name of Al-Biruni went with his captors to the land of India. There, a great scholar, he wrote a book considered by most to be one of the first books of anthropology. In it, he described not just the way of life of the Indians, but rather their cosmology, what they thought God was, what they thought humans were, what their place in the universe was. And what he found out was that Hinduism essentially is a monotheism, is a worshipping of one thing, but it is manifested all around us. This links to the quotation that I have been given today by Beth Brandt, a Mohawk writer, essayist, and poet. We do not worship nature, we are a part of it. I am analyzing this today and interpreting it as nature affects us directly, uh, affects us bilaterally, if you will. It is a codependent system. And so today, I will be discussing this through three points. The Dakota or uh, the Dakota 
uh, creation story as part of the uh, Ochiti Sakoen, the BP oil spill, and the California wildfires. To our first point, the Dakota believe that in the beginning of the universe when humans were created, they made a, a pact, a bond, a covenant with the buffalo, with the bison, with the calves. And a creator of those buffalo came down in the form of a woman called White Calf Woman and made this compact with them. It shows much more than that they are synonymous or that they are interrelated with each other, but rather the pack said that both of these people feed off of each other, react to each other, and sustain each other in different ways. In the very Dakota creation story, we see that they do not worship the nature as an entity in itself, but rather as a partner, as standing toe to toe and understanding that your actions affect everything around you, in particular nature, which we live in. Now, we live in nature, but sometimes that nature gets out of hand or out of context, which brings me to the BP oil spill. There have been many other oil spills since this. And in fact, it has not stopped since then. But oil spills all have something in common. The worshipping of nature. The worshipping, I should say, of greed that comes from the natural resources that nature gives us. What we see through the BP oil spill especially, but also through all of these other oil spills, is that regard for nature, that bilateral companionship that nature has with us and we with nature is often overlooked and we start to worship an aspect of nature as supremely powerful, forgetting that when we raise something above another thing, the thing we are forgetting, its value becomes less and less to us as the value of the other thing, in this case oil, grows. Now, another thing about growing, uh, as it grows, we see that when we worship nature, it leads to a out of balance of nature, of our priorities for being a steward of nature. And this brings us to our last point, that of the California wildfires. Now, Native Americans for a long time have been crying for their land stewardship back because they, having lived here for thousands of years, understand the bilateral relationship of humans and nature. In fact, when the explorers visited Yellowstone, they remarked that there were wide open grasslands like parks back in Europe. But this was all because of the Native Americans' efforts to bring about sustainability to the land. And right now in America, we actually have a, uh, a lack of this, in which forests are left to overgrow and we idealize this form of nature as untouched. And through all these three points, we see that when we start to worship nature, when we start to live out of balance with it, it actually creates very destructive forces. And so we should remember Hindu mythology and the Dakota creation story that we must live with everything around us because everything around us affects us and others. And those others affect ourselves. The second event you will see tonight is an informative speech. This type of speech introduces cutting-edge topics and seeks to help the audience understand the subject by using well-developed explanations that are supported with factual information. The goal is not to sway an audience's opinion, but rather to share with them a wealth of knowledge regarding innovations and discoveries. The informative speaker you will hear from tonight is Christina Peterson. The KwaZulu Natal Province in South Africa is no stranger to drought. Back in 2019, dozens of rural communities had to survive weeks without municipal water, depending instead upon truck deliveries that often never came. By November, the province was experiencing a worsening drought with severe shortages. Many of the larger towns were declared a disaster area. This story, reported by National Geographic last January, spotlights the growing water crisis affecting billions of people 
across the globe. In fact, a Dyer report published in a 2019 journal, Nature, warned that by 2050, half of the world's population may no longer have safe water. However, there is cause for hope in addressing this impending crisis. Researchers at the King Abdullah University in Saudi Arabia have developed a cost-effective way to desalinate seawater and produce clean energy as a byproduct. Their device, which was announced in the June 2021 issue of the peer-reviewed journal Juul, is called the PV Membrane Distillation Evaporative Crystallizer, or PME for short. Thank goodness. While exciting for a variety of reasons, it has the potential to be a game changer in safely bringing clean water and power to some of the most drought-stricken places on the planet. So today I am here to tell you about this exciting new breakthrough in desalination technology. We will first dive into the revolutionary technology behind PME, then generate a better understanding of its applications, before finally soaking up the benefits and filtering through some limitations. You and I cannot drink saline water. The concentrated salt content is too much for our kidneys to filter. That's where desalination comes in. So first, let's explore the technology. In a special topics paper, last accessed September 18, 2021, the US Geological Survey explains that desalination is one of the world's oldest forms of water treatment. However, exciting new developments with PME technology show us it remains one of our best. According to a report published in the June 2021 issue of Mashable Middle East, the PME device consists of a solar cell situated on a series of stainless steel layers. These facilitate a multi-stage distillation. It's this process that makes salt water drinkable. As solar energy contacts the device, two key things happen. First, solar energy activates the device, pumping seawater into the evaporation center. Once there, Excess heat from the solar cell triggers evaporation and removes pure H2O from the mixture. The leftovers, known as brine, filter down through several layers until they come into contact with the device's evaporative crystallizer. Unlike previous attempts at large-scale desalination, this part of the process represents a major shift in the way the desalination works. You see, one of the key drawbacks to desalination is the creation of the concentrated waste brine. According to a journal published in the October 2021 Journal of Cleaner Production, waste brine has raised great concerns due to its detrimental impact on surrounding communities and their fauna and flora. However, the authors go on to explain that zero liquid discharge technologies used by the King Abdullah University research team avoids this pitfall. This is because they use excess heat from the previous stage for another cycle of evaporation. This fully extracts all liquid, leaving only solid salt behind. Kind of like Taylor Swift, right after a breakup. Anyway, the end result is clean water, excess energy, and solid salt that can safely be used for other nutritional or industrial purposes. The way PME purifies salt water really has the power to make some waves. Now that we've seen how it works, Let's look at the three key benefits to this technology. First, the obvious. PME technology provides a method to safely convert seawater into clean, drinkable water. This is important because an April 2020 study in the Journal of Science Advances describes a dire imbalance between the supply and the demand for clean water. Climate change continues to exacerbate droughts and impact growing seasons. There is real concern that the water supply will not be able to meet basic agricultural demands. Perhaps the most alarming prediction in their paper was that by 2050, up to 25% of the global croplands will lack the water needed to sustain them. This has the potential to create one of the worst famines in human history. However, the aforementioned Jewel article explains that PME-based desalination plants can produce fresh water from seawater at almost double the previous rates. Simply put, PME gives us a fighting chance to maintain and even grow our fresh water supply during extreme drought conditions. Second, PME has far less environmental impact than traditional desalination technology. This is because PME is a low waste system that reuses heat instead of wasting it. In a June 2021 report by Physics World, lead science reporter Michael Allen explains that PME is far more efficient than previous technology. Instead of using a single stage evaporation cycle, waste energy is reused again 
and again until no liquid remains. Not only does this maximize the water produced in the process, but it creates solid salt in place of the far more difficult to handle brine concentrate. Allen explains that this lowers overall power needs while ensuring that PME-based plants won't have the pollution problems associated with past desalination technology. And lastly, PME has the ability to create additional clean energy. In the aforementioned Jewel article, the research team explains that not only did previous technology consume a lot of energy, but they only partially desalinated seawater. In comparison, PME's multi-stage cycle produces far more water with far less energy and actually leaves a surplus. This means that PME could provide additional green energy to local power grids. Now that we've seen the workings and the potential of PME, let's look at some limitations and implications. Currently, desalination is largely limited to more affluent countries, especially those with rare earth elements and coastlines that give them access to seawater. The aforementioned Jewel article explains that while the bulk of the PME device can be readily sourced, the solar technology used is a new variety. It is a novel, highly efficient solar cell that requires gallium, indium, arsenic, bismuth, and selenium. It sounds like I'm taking roll call out of fancy Silicon Valley school, but these are actually rare earth elements. Because they are truly rare, they are not readily available. In the March 2021 Journal of Renewable and Sustainable Energy Reviews points out that increased demand for these solar cells in Western countries and global supply chain problems make it hard to implement PME. There is a growing pressure from the scientific community for governments to develop better international framework for the distribution and use of these cells. Scott Berger, an energy fellow at MIT, explained in the 2021 MIT Energy Intuitive that it may come down to making hard choices. We can allocate resources to power projects that make saltwater drinkable, or we can put solar panels on the roofs of folks living in wealthy countries. However, we likely can't do both. Today, we have explored the revolutionary technology known as PME. We've generated a better understanding of its applications, soaked up the benefits, and filtered through some limitations. It's no secret that we need a solution to support the growing population's freshwater needs. PME will give families a chance at that, with its low energy cost and high output. Since the water crisis of 2018 and 2019, South Africa has made major investments in its water infrastructure. This past March, the Mail and Guardian, one of South Africa's biggest newspapers, reports that the government plans to pass a massive spending bill to create a network of desalination plants across the country. With technology like PME, it just may be possible to stop the next water crisis before it starts. The third speech you will hear is a persuasive speech. This is a presentation that seeks to identify and describe an ongoing problem. The speaker uses emotion, logic, and credibility in an attempt to urge the audience to act on a controversial issue. Tonight, Rick Sequeira will present his persuasive speech. This is a $100 bill. It's about four thousandths of an inch thick, and if I had a stack, that was as tall as I am, I'd have almost $1.7 million. Now a stack of $100 bills, three and a half times the height of Mount Everest, still wouldn't cover what the United States government and in turn us, the American people, owe. Our national debt is rising and with it comes consequences. A 2021 Peter G. Peterson Foundation article spells out that as our long-term fiscal issues continue to go ignored, our overall economic status continues to weaken. Our national debt is approaching $30 trillion, and it's a problem that politicians seem to disregard. I'm here to convince you that it cannot be allowed to continue. So today we'll discuss the problem that the national debt constitutes, explain what caused us to reach this point before finally proposing some controversial solutions. So first, let's look at some of the problems that a high national debt produces. The national debt has been a constant figure in American politics since 1835, which as NPR reported in 2021, was the last time that the United States paid off its national debt at the hands of President Jackson. Our debt has fluctuated throughout history, but in recent years it has reached its highest level ever. After the conclusion of the Second World War, our national debt was equal to 112% of our nation's gross domestic product, 
But now that number is 140% of our nation's GDP. According to Kimberly Amadeo's 2021 article, U.S. Debt by Year. This high national debt brings both personal and political problems. First, the personal consequences. A 2021 Investopedia article spells out that as interest rates rise, a result of a high national debt, we lose critical funding for social services. It becomes harder, harder to borrow money for a down payment on a home. Now, when taken individually, it might seem like we just need to grin and bear it and accept these frustrating realities. But over time, that same article says that a decrease in quality of life will occur for future generations. Next, the political consequences. Kimberly Amadeo's 2021 article, The Real Owner of the U.S. Debt, goes to the entities which the United States owes. Japan and China both own over $1 trillion in U.S. debt each, the most of any foreign country. The Federal Reserve, $10 trillion. Insurance companies, a quarter trillion dollars. Mutual funds, two and a half trillion dollars. Banks, corporate businesses, and other investors, another two trillion dollars. Now, what does this mean for the political power these entities hold? That same 2021 Investopedia article says that even the threat of defaulting on interest payments alone compromise our economic, social, and political standing worldwide. Now that we've looked at some of the problems that this national debt brings with it, let's look at how this came into fruition. So what is at the root of the national debt? Deficit spending is the main factor. Our current annual deficit is sitting at around $2.3 trillion, with some estimates putting that as high as $4.5 trillion. Fiscal and monetary policy tie into the previously mentioned amounts and while the government brings in $3.5 trillion each and every year, it spends $8 trillion yearly. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the biggest spenders in the current budget, each having price tags of over $1 trillion each. Military and war spending comes in third place, costing the American people $750 billion each and every year. Monetary policy also affects the debt. And since the Central Bank of the United States, the Federal Reserve, can adjust interest rates by either increasing or decreasing the money supply at will, our national debt and the interest on that debt fluctuates as a result. The United States owes close to half a trillion dollars in interest payments alone. Attitudes and societal norms have also played into creating this issue. The debt ceiling is a hot button topic in Washington, D.C., Yet over the years, the legislation to raise the ceiling is reoccurring with bipartisan support. The years of 1995 and 1996 are cataloged in a 1996 report by the Congressional Budget Office when the debate over raising the debt ceiling resulted in two separate instances of government shutdown. The Senate is again rushing to suspend the debt ceiling in 2021 in order to avoid a government shutdown. When the government shuts down Federal funds cease to be released. Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid do not release payments. Regarding one of the most recent government shutdowns in 2019, Ebony Williams confided in CNBC, I'm a single mother, so it was not stressful because of me, but because I had to worry about feeding my child. Ebony invests faith in our government like many of us, but repeated failures erode that trust. Other government agencies would also be affected, including the TSA, FDA, EPA, and even the National Park Service. So now we know that the problem we're facing and we know how this came to be. Let's look at some solutions. The solution is not easy and it is twofold. Increased tax revenue and decreased spending. Adjusting interest rates is one of the ways the United States government can increase tax revenue. In times of economic downturn, the Federal Reserve has lowered interest rates to the level where many unwilling borrowers were convinced to borrow. Even after paying back these loans, the average individual is better off than before, often with an increased income. By implementing these changes, the United States government can increase the incomes for many Americans, thus increasing tax revenue without directly affecting tax rates. A value-added tax, which is a tax that is added between each step of the process of goods being manufactured and sold 
could also be implemented for individuals and firms who earn over a predetermined amount. 160 countries have this system in place, with the United States being the only developed country that does not. Currently, the effective tax rate for those who make over $550,000 a year is 7.4%, but those who make under $20,000 are taxed on average 11.4%, according to the Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy. A value-added tax could help level the playing field and help pay off our national debt. In 1992, which was the last time a government agency did a real study on implementing a value-added tax, the Congressional Budget Office found that a 5% value-added tax could add close to $650 billion in tax revenue yearly, adjusted for inflation. A 2019 Tax Foundation model included within Kyle Parmelou's article, the Re Does Andrew Yang's Freedom Dividend Add Up?, found that a 10% value-added tax could add close to a trillion dollars in tax revenue yearly. Infrastructure programs could also be implemented to significantly stimulate the economy, again creating wealth to then be taxed. An Oxford Review of Economic Policy journal entry from 2016 says that if investment reaches a point where 15% of total investment in the country goes toward infrastructure, then economic growth can be expected to rise to 8%. Now the current rate of economic growth in this country is 4%, so doubling that would generate massive amounts of wealth to then be taxed. Massive public works programs were implemented as part of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal during the Great Depression, and they were shown to stimulate the 1930s American economy, as stated by Kristen Downey in her 2009 book, The Woman Behind the New Deal. Cutting spending is the second part of the solution. According to the Government of Canada's experience eliminating the deficit from 1992 to 1994, written by Jocelyn Bergeon, Canada was able to significantly reduce their national debt by cutting spending in the 1990s. Plans have been proposed in the United States before, and a 2020 Council of Foreign Relations article written by James McBride entitled The National Debt Dilemma speaks of the 2010 simpson bowles plan, which did eventually lack bipartisan support, but would combat our national debt by cutting spending across the board. Some would argue that government-funded social programs help our economic well-being. However, the Bureau of Economic Research found that cuts in public spending boost private investment and help our economic growth overall. By cutting spending, if paired with the increased tax revenue described earlier, we could decrease our national debt significantly and quickly. So today we've seen our national debt continue to rise it cannot be allowed to continue. We've looked at the problem, the causes, and potential solutions to our national debt crisis. Anyone can see that this problem is not going to disappear on its own. Write to your local congressman and tell them that this is a pressing issue. It's true that I may never literally see a stack of bills as tall as I am, and you may not either, but we are standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with this problem, and it's time to look it in the eye. Our fourth event is prose. In this presentation, the speaker performs a piece of published literature. Performers seek to move audiences and make their point by embodying the characters and inviting viewers to become immersed in the act of storytelling. The performer you will see tonight is Alexis Rangel. I was 20 years old. It was my first time going to Florida. My first trip alone with friends, Tiara, and her cousin, Akira. The trip was the only thing we talked about for weeks. It was my first time getting on a plane, and it was my first time... in Pulse Nightclub in Orlando. We were having so much fun that night, dancing and being silly. We embodied the phrase, leave everything on the dance floor. And we did.
Pulse nightclub was the scene of the deadliest mass shooting in the United States when it occurred, with 49 people killed and 53 injured. According to a regularly updated tally from the Gun Violence Archive, the United States leads the world in death by mass shooting. We are on set to surpass our record in 2021. In the 2021 issue of the International Review of Psychiatry, criminology professor Dr. Adam Langford writes, Despite the fact that we have less than 5% of the world's population, we have about 30% of the world's public mass shooters. Increasingly, these shooters are driven by racism and homophobia. In 2019, the New York Times reported that LGBTQ plus individuals are significantly more likely to be the target of hate crimes involving guns. In the following speech, we can see that thoughts and prayers are no longer enough. Survive, then live. By Patience Murray. We heard the first shots of the machine gun. I dropped to the floor, scooting backwards away from all the chaos, and I kept moving and moving until I felt the cool ground underneath my palms. I realized that somehow I miraculously scooted my way through an exit and made it outside. When I looked up, I saw Akira coming towards me. She said, Tiara was still inside. I lifted myself up from the floor without any hesitation. We rushed back in for her. I had never felt this kind of determination, but leaving Tiara behind wasn't an option. She was down by the par, paralyzed with fear. Her eyes were lost. We didn't have any time to think. We saw people rushing into the bathrooms, so we decided to follow them. There were four stalls, so we jammed ourselves into the handicap one with about 20 other people. By this point, we could still hear the gunshots and the screams, but the music had stopped. There was a brief moment of silence. And everyone started talking again. There were some people on their phones, and there was others that were begging people to remain quiet. Then, the gunfire started again. This time was in our bathroom. The shooter came in and fired endless rounds of bullets at us, and we were screaming and scrambling along the floor. Then, the shooter's gun jammed. The gunfire had stopped. When I looked down at my leg, I could see a hole the size of a penny pouring red streams of blood. Underneath the stall, I could see the shooter's feet and his machine gun. It was my first time seeing a machine gun in real life. I lifted my head from the floor and I saw Kira. She had her phone braced to her ear while she was bracing her bleeding arm and I heard her say, please, please come help us, I've been shot. I desperately hoped her call would save us all. Then, out of nowhere, the man said, Get off your phones. Not in a yelling voice, not in an angry voice. It was a calm voice. It was terrifying. I didn't dare pick up my phone. And besides, the only people that I knew lived a thousand miles away. It was the first time I had left the state without telling my father. So I started to cry. And then I felt a hand rubbing my arm, trying to console me. And I don't know whose hand that was, but I appreciate that hand so much. I found it harder 
to keep my eyes open. But I wasn't sure if I was falling asleep or if I was dying. Then I heard a phone ring and it rang and rang and kept ringing and the, the shooter started making his own calls to 911 claiming that if they didn't leave us alone, he'd, he'd detonate the explosives that he had in his car. At first, all I had to worry about was him shooting me again. But now I feared being blown to pieces. Laying in excruciating pain makes you beg God to take the soul out of your body. It makes you pray and ask forgiveness. It makes you regret not saying all the things you wish you told people, yet extremely grateful for the things you did say. Suddenly, there was a loud boom. The entire building shook, and then there was a boom even louder than the second, and I just knew that this was it. I was about to die. The shooter ran into the stall and began firing at people. Didn't move. Didn't breathe. Suddenly, the wall came crashing down and debris covered my face, but I could still see a light shining through the hole in the wall. The police asked the man to put down his weapon, and then the whole room erupted with gunfire. Then, there was nothing. The gunfire had stopped. I could still see the images of my legs on the stretcher with the backdrop of those ambulance doors engraved in my mind forever. The hospital was a blur, but I do remember the nurse handing me the phone. I had memorized my father's number in case of an emergency, and today I was glad I did. The hospital explained the situation to my father. I was being taken into surgery. They handed the phone to me. I tried my best to remain calm and clear. I didn't want my father to hear the fear in my voice like I heard the confusion in his. He always said, you're gonna be okay. And my father was no doctor, but I believed him. Tiara survived a gunshot to her side, but Akira didn't make it. Earlier that night, we were celebrating all of her successes, and now she was gone. It's been three years since the shooting. I remember my first time walking again, my first time going to a club again, and my first time being happy again. But no matter how happy I am, I always ask God, why me? I think about the odds. And every day I think of that. And every day I'm living to figure out the answer to that question. We have come to our final event, debate. In this style of debate, speakers are randomly assigned to argue opposing sides of a controversial issue. Debate is a true test of critical thinking and strategy because speakers must often argue for a side they may not personally agree with. Despite this, the speakers must identify and present a valid and compelling case in order to win. The team who prepares the best arguments for their side is declared the winner. In this debate, you will hear from an affirmative speaker and a negative speaker. Tonight, our debaters are Alexis Rangel on the affirmative and Joshua Bruce on the negative. All right, and thanks for that, Tori. And with that, we'll go ahead and begin the debate. 
I want to welcome you all to the debate portion of the evening. In front of you all, we have two members of the speech and debate team who have struck some topics and are ready to present an exciting debate on the issue of the death penalty. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to our affirmative debater, Alexis. Alexis, we will start out with the first affirmative constructive speech. This is a speech not meant to be longer than five minutes. Whenever you are ready, we can begin. Perfect. So I know Ryan just said he was ready. Joshua, the negation, are you ready? And I'll go out on a limb and assume that the individuals at home are ready as well. That being said, I have five minutes and my time is starting now. I just want to start off by saying thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you to Ryan, Joshua, and everybody at home for watching this debate. That being said, a lot to cover. Let's get right into it. Observation one, resolutional analysis. The resolution at hand, the U.S. should abolish the death penalty. Based on the wording of the topic, we can see this is a policy resolution. Thus, we would ask our judges to evaluate the debate through a lens of net benefits. If I'm able to prove that abolishing the death penalty will improve our safety, then I should win the debate. If I fail to accomplish that goal, or if my opponent proves that abolishing the death penalty would negatively impact society, I should lose. Key terms. According to Oxford Dictionary, death penalty refers to the punishment of execution administered to someone legally convicted of a crime. All of the definitions we define contextually. Feel free to clarify terms during cross-examination. Observation two, background. Currently, 27 states and the federal government allow the death penalty. According to the October 2021 entry on issues and controversies, with the exception of Belarus, the United States is the only Western democracy that still regularly executes people. However, it is costly and effective and has been wrongfully administered. Despite this, current U.S. law and constitutional interpretations allow for it. Next, the plan. The U.S. Congress, 50 U.S. states, and all U.S. territories should pass a law that abolished the death penalty. Solvency? The plan will pass at both the state and federal levels to ensure no jurisdiction can carry out capital punishment. All current death row inmates would have their sentences commute, commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole. We will hold up Delaware as a model. When Delaware abolished the death penalty, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that all remaining death row inmates must have their sentences commuted to the next harshest punishment. This is according to SCOTUS website in August 2016. My first advantage today, titled Wrongful Executions. First, the uniqueness. The United States has carried out the death penalty on individuals later proven to be innocent. A February 2021 article from the National Geographic interviewed Michael Radlett, a death penalty scholar and sociologist. He stated the following, there is a wide array of blunders that can cause erroneous convictions in capital cases. Police officers might secure a coerced or otherwise false confession. Prosecutors occasionally suppress exculpatory evidence. Sometimes there is a well-intentioned but mistaken eyewitness identification. Most common is perjury by prosecution witnesses. Link. If this plan were to pass and the death penalty were abolished, it would never be possible to wrongfully execute an individual again. Internal link. If we fail to abolish the death penalty, wrongful executions will continue to happen. There are most likely several innocent individuals who are currently on death row. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences determined that at least 4% of the people on death row are likely innocent. Researchers estimate that at least 340 U.S. inmates that it could have been exonerated while they were sentenced to death in, since 1973. According to the Equal Justice Initiative in Alabama alone, over 160 death sentences have been invalidated by state and federal courts. There are two key impacts. First, by abolishing the death penalty, we eliminate the possibility of executing innocent people. Death is permanent. These mistakes cannot be reversed. Second, when we convict an innocent person of crime, it means the truly guilty party remains free and unchecked. My second advantage, costly financial bur burden. Uniqueness. The burden to try, convict, house, and execute individuals is exceptionally expensive for states. Financial facts of the death penalty conclude that the average death penalty case costs $1.26 million per person. Here in Modesto, the Scott Peterson conviction, which is now getting a new trial, cost Stanislaus County over $2.64 million, as reported by the Modesto B back in 2007. Link. Abolishing the death penalty saves states large amounts of money currently spent prosecuting these cases. 
internal link. After repeal, states reap significant financial benefits. For example, a 2011 opinion published in the Loyola of Los Angeles Law Review estimates California could have saved $4 billion had we not reinstated the death penalty back in 1987 the impact. Thus, passing this plan provides significant financial impacts, allowing states to, one, avoid financial collapse, and two, allocate funds to better policing, schools, and infrastructure. So throughout the development of this case, we have brought up two critical advantages, wrongful executions and costly financial burdens, which lay out a really solid platform on why I, the affirmative, should win this debate later on. The United States should abolish the death penalty. That being said, I now sign open for cross-examination. Let me go ahead and get my timer going. All right, so two minutes cross-examination whenever you are ready. Yep. Hey, Alexis, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing, doing pretty well. How are you doing? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm getting there, and debating is always awesome, and I'm here, so yeah. All right, so I just have a couple of questions for you, uh, well, a few. So real quick, uh, just to clarify, your plan is, is that you want Congress, all 50 states, and the U.S. territories to pass laws? That is correct. Okay. Uh, and once again, in your second advantage, how much did you say that the death penalty uh, costs average per person, per case? Yeah. So to reiterate the sentence again, financial facts of the death penalty conclude the average death penalty case costs $1.26 million per person. Okay. And I, I want to make sure um, I heard you made the point uh, that California could have saved four billions uh, after we reinstated the death penalty. I, I believe just just to clarify, um, we actually reinstated it in 78, um, not 87. Um, uh, just... Yes, it is 78. If I made that mistake, it was a um, one on presentation rather than what is actually stated. Uh, right. I'm in writings. I have 1978. All right. Just wanted to make sure we got that fact right. <laughs> All right. Um, and then I had another point that I wanted to ask. And then the Scott Peterson case, how much was that? Uh, it was cost in the county. Right. So here in Modesto, within San Luis County, uh, the Scott Peterson conviction, which is now getting a new trial, so it will be increased from the current number stated, uh, cost San Luis County over $2.64 million. And this is a report from Modesto B back in 2007. Okay. All right. I believe that's time. All right, thank you very much for that cross-examination. With this, we will turn the floor over to the negative. Joshua, this is your first negative constructive speech. You get up to six minutes for this one, but please start us off with a brief off-time roadmap before you begin your constructive. All righty. Um, judge, we're going to go ahead and initially dive into the background um, topic case presented by the affirmative. We're going to go ahead afterwards and have a response for the first and second advantages. And then afterwards, we're going to go ahead and dive into my first and only disadvantage today. All righty. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, this is debating is awesome. I always love being here. Uh, real quick, uh, I want to thank Alexis, uh, you know, for being on their side. It's always fun debating. Uh, you know, uh, especially whenever we uh, have these AF neg, uh, neg debates where we just seem to pair up very well. So real quick, uh, I want to dive into the background. So the affirmative uh, makes some very useful points uh, regarding the death penalty. However, uh, we must look at this into context. According to Vox in 2020, the use of the death penalty is already at a new low and has dropped um, <clears throat> steeply since the 1990s. Throughout my case, you will see that this means that the affirmative's harms are not as widespread as they seem at first glance. Additionally, it means that the death penalty is being reserved for criminal cases that truly warrant it. Um, as for the first advantage regarding the wrongful con uh, conviction, <clears throat> first, let's look at the affirmative's own numbers. They suggest that up to 4% of death row inmates are innocent. This means that 96% are guilty. Additionally, 
the study they refer to analyzed all instances of capital punishment since the 1970s, when DNA testing was often inaccurate. However, the technology has improved, decreasing the rates of mistakes in recent convictions. David R. Dow, who is a law professor at the University of Houston, he stated to The Atlantic in 2021 that our scientific, <coughs> our scientific testing of biological material is far more advanced now. And he says that you are not going to have cases where you can do testing five or ten years from now that you, can, you can't do today. <clears throat> Thus, when we look at the numbers, they favor my position in this debate. Second, eliminating the death penalty does not solve for wrongful convictions, only for wrongful executions. Innocent people will spend their lives in prison under the world of the affirmative. As for the second, uh, the second advantage, <clears throat> when in regards to costs, the expense makes sense. It's a good thing. In 2016, a fact check by Ballot uh, Ballotpedia explains that the Supreme Court established a death is different jurisprudence. It required greater rigor in capital punishment cases. The report points out that these cases required more lawyers, <clears throat> more lawyers, more witnesses, more time, and that these efforts are meant to ensure that the rights are properly accorded to the defendant. This turns the affirmative's argument. If we abolish the death penalty, Judge, this level of rigor is also eliminated. Even more innocent people are at risk of wrongful conviction and life in prison because we wanted a cheaper option. Now, on to my second disadvantage today, Judge. Today, simply put, it's prison safety. My uniqueness is that the murder rate in the United States has trended downward since the 1990s. The FBI reported in 2016 that the U.S. homicide rate was as low at its lowest level it had been since the 1970s. However, these statistics fail to look at the murder rates inside prisons. An April 2021 report by Status Status Statistia <laughs> revealed that state prisoner homicides homicides were increased by 300% in states that abolished the death penalty and rehoused former death row inmates into the general population. 300% in the states where they abolished that death penalty judge. A 2017 report by the U.S. Department of Justice also comments on a significant increase in correctional officers being seriously harmed in prisons. A 2015 Bureau of Prisons <laughs> report explained that attacks on correctional officers had dramatically increased in states that integrated former death row inmates. By fully, my, my link is by fully abolishing the death penalty judge, the affirmative doubles down on a policy that has already shown to make prisons less safe for inmates and guards alike. For my internal link, I state that after implementation, the U.S. will see the homicide rates in jails rise and conditions further deteriorate. While in prison, it is not uncommon for those receiving life in jail sentences to commit homicide or other crimes while in jail, since there, <clears throat> since there is no worse punishment that they could receive once there. The Borough of Justice Statistics most recent data that was published in 2020 notes that the state prisons are increasingly deadly places with homicides more than doubling in the last decade. The cor this correlated with a string of state courts striking down death penalty laws as unconstitutional and forcing reintegration of death row inmates into general population. My impacts is just this. Thus, we can see that the affirmative plan results in more loss of life and harm to those that work and serve sentences in U.S. prisons. Judge, I think my case is rather simple. It's, it's just it's a case for the negation, please. And, and thank you. And thank you very much for that speech, Joshua. Let's go ahead and open things back up then for cross-examination. Alexis, this is your cross X period. You got two minutes. I'm ready when you are. 
I have two minutes. Is the, no, Ryan, you said he was ready. Is the negation ready? Beautiful, once again, hoping those at home are ready as well. So that means that I have two minutes and my time is starting now. So I just wanna start by saying thank you for that amazing speech. However, I did have a few questions for you. So first, uh, you mentioned within your speech that there is a small amount of people on death row, right? Correct. Okay, so would this minimal amount of individuals on death row result in a minimal impact on prison safety then? Uh, I would not agree with that statement, no. Uh, why not? Well, considering these people are highly violent, um, just a single as a resource in that prison that's increased can increase the potential for dangers in the prison. So no, I wouldn't consider it a low impact. And then going on to the next question, would you argue the United States is a progressive country? I would argue that the United States, it tries to be, at least. So what is keeping the United States from abolishing the death penalty when in my background I mentioned how the United States, with the exception of Belarus, is the only one that still continues with these government-mandated executions? Uh, the nation often tries to follow the attitude of its citizenry at the time. So in, with, in regards to citizenry, is this for, inferred by you or is it something that's statistically proven? People want to murder these individuals on death row? I don't, I don't think that's the idea at hand, but considering the state of California recently uh, positioned and was able to continuously keep death row in, in, in play, I'd say with the most populous state, I'd say that's a good temper of the nation. Gotcha. And then I'll go ahead and elaborate on the question. Ten seconds left. Uh, rather not leave a question unanswered. So I'll go ahead and concede the rest of that time. I believe it was nine seconds that were left remaining. All right. Thank you both for that cross-examination period. With that, let's go ahead and turn the floor over to the affirmative once again. This is your first affirmative rebuttal speech. You get up to three minutes for this one. But again, please start us off with a brief off time roadmap before you begin your time. Yes. So I will go ahead and begin with the top of case. Then I will go ahead and go into the on case or, or the off case arguments first. So addressing what the negation presented and his disadvantage and then go ahead to the two on case advantages. So First, we're going to start with top case, then go to DA1, and then go to 81 and 82. That being said, I have three minutes for this speech. Is the negation ready, judge ready, individuals at home? Beautiful. So I have three minutes, and my time is starting now. So just to get the pleasantries out there, I wanted to say thank you again, Josh, for that amazing speech, amazing cross-examination. Thank you to everyone for putting together, and thank you to everybody at home. That being said, jumping right into the top of case. Uh, the negation accepted every single thing that I mentioned in the top of case, but had some reputation on the background, mentioning a Box 2020 article about how the individuals on death row truly warrant it. However, I would argue that innocent individuals do not warrant this death row. However, in addition to that, uh, the negation also mentions there's a, a new low of individuals who are on death row, but I would argue that there is a key difference between low and zero, and that's something we will further elaborate on it throughout the development of this debate. Going on to the um, to the disadvantage, I have two responses to the disadvantage in, regarding, in regards to prison safety. First, the logic in this argument conflates cor uh, correlation with causation. The negative suggests that integrating death row inmates has made prisons less safe, but in the same time frame, prisons have become significantly overcrowded, a variable that we cannot ignore. As the negation can, uh, can argued with in the cross-examination, a very minimal amount of individuals who are on death row, um, there's a very minimal amount, therefore their impact is arguably very minimal as well. Second, in the same Bureau of Justice report than uh, the, the negative sites, it does not connect the increase in homicides to the increase in death row inmates being released. In fact, death row inmates make up a very small number of individuals in prison. These two reasons show that abolishing the death penalty does not uniquely make prisons less safe and there is no real disadvantage to the plan. Going on to the on-case arguments in advantage one, wrongful executions. Mitigation mentions and reiterates the fact that there is up to 4% and 94% are otherwise guilty. However, it is really critical to look at the wording of these statistics, up to 4%. This argues that there is a possibility for it to be higher. We should not eliminate its sad possibility because this is human lives we are ultimately talking about. 
The integration also mentions there is an improvement in testing and how my plan or in my world with passing this plan, they will eliminate wrongful execution with not conviction. Um, agreeing with the fact that there is improvements in the testing, maybe um, it will help press this, it will help in aiding this critical issue. Maybe these improvements in the testing will help these individuals who are um, wrongfully convicted um, to be released. So therefore we can take this, uh, this argument of improving the testing. We can not only eliminate those who are wrongfully convicted, but also through this beautiful uh, statement of the negation made also increase in the amount of convictions who are innocent being therefore released. Going on to the second advantage, costly financial burden. The negation mentions how this is a good thing. However, I'd argue this is not a good thing, especially when it has the capacity of enlarging my impact. An impact that I mentioned within my second advantage that went un that went unrefuted was the fact that it will allow for funds to go towards better policing schools and infrastructure. Re reinvesting into the statement that I made specifically in Stanislaus County, where many of us live, the Scott Peterson case cost Stanislaus County $2.64 million and is getting a new trial. This money can be better used in policing. The negation goes to uh, mentions the correction officers and the attacks on correction officers. Reiterating back to this crucial impact, if we allocate funds to better policing, we can help in these um, correction officers allow more incentive for individuals to be correction officers and better expand on the training required. Therefore, we can lessen these impacts that the negation is making. Um, and the, within this, we can also, oh, and that is my time. All right, and thank you very much for that, Alexis. At this point, we are going to turn things back over to the negative. Joshua, this is your negative rebuttal and summary speech. You get up to five minutes for this speech, but please start us off with a brief off time roadmap and keep in mind it's your last speech of the debate. So make your case. I am ready when you are. Awesome. Um, Judge, I'm going to go ahead and dive into uh, first and foremost, uh, quickly touch on the top of case. I'm going to talk about the reputations made in regards to the first and second advantage, and then I'm going to reapproach my disadvantage. And then lastly, I'm going to put in some voters as to why I feel that you should be giving us um, the case of the negation today. Thank you. Uh, go ahead and start in my timer now. Alexis, thank you for being on the side. It's always great debating you, and this is a great topic to be debating, honestly. So let's, uh, let's get at it. Um, real quick, um, the top of case, um, you know, you made some points about uh, low not being zero. Um, I would argue that <clears throat> whereas the death penalty uh, is currently uh, a system that is in place in this country and hasn't been uh, pushed for abolishment by the people yet and even in the state of california being as my affirmative like the state of uh, you know a progressive one of the more progressive states and part of the progressive nation as the affirmative tried to argue um it was kept in place so yes low is important yes it's not zero judge but at the same token i think our points are very invalid that the that the rates have dropped and that is seen because of the improved testing and it's necessary that we get that into understanding. And we're gonna dive into the first advantage. I mean, that's, that's connecting right into the first advantage where in the last few years, we've been able to have some test improvements that we won't have to have tests go in five, 10 years down the line. We'd be able to do that now as cited by the professor from the University of Houston. <clears throat> My uh, my other side makes the argument that up to 4% can be higher. I would state that up to 4% is pretty clear that it's up to 4%. I don't know how that's higher. Um, as for wrongful convictions, um, maybe aided, uh, my, my affirmative made the arguments of, I'm not really sure. All, all I'm going to make the point again is, is that eliminating the death penalty, it doesn't, it doesn't take away from wrongful convictions. Uh, and I think that's the most important point here is that innocent people will still, still be spending their lives in prison um, if it, under this affirmative case. It doesn't take away from that. Um, I think that's the most important point here. And with these improved tests, um, yeah, we need to keep that in mind. 
uh, judge. The fact is, is like the, they said, up to 4% on death row can be innocent. Um, I know that the affirmative wants to state that it could be more, but it states uh, up to, which means that over 90 or 96% of those people are guilty. Um, we need to keep that in mind. Uh, <clears throat> switching over to the second advantage, I want to make sure that we reiterate the point that the increased money is good. The expenses are is good that the uh, Supreme Court uh, found that death row or death is a different jurisprudence, <coughs> which requires a greater rigor in capital um, judge. And we want to make sure that that greater rigor is kept into place. Uh, as for increased funding to go to schools, there's no guarantee that funding from the criminal justice system is going to be able to be routed to the police budget or to school budgets. I'm not really sure where my AF makes that case. Um, clear in point, we need that greater rigor. We need to make sure that these wrongful convictions are not being kept um, or are, are not being increased. Uh, the AF makes a very valid point that that's something that needs to be taken advantage of, but the greater rigor actually plays in favor of our case. Um, lastly, going back to my disadvantage, um, <clears throat> once again, the murder rate is going down as per the FBI judge. Uh, and as part of April 2001 statistics, we have 300% uh, increase in murders within the uh, prisons. I know that my AF makes the argument that there is an increase in uh, population. I would say a lot of those are nonviolent offenders. Uh, we're not concerned. Uh, those nonviolent offenders don't have a track record for having violent offenses. It's the violent offenders that are concerning, and we want to make sure that the ones that are most violent are kept out because those people are also harming our corrections officers, um, as reported by the Justice uh, Department of Justice. <clears throat> so once again, my impact for my disadvantage is very simple: um, that it will it will result in more loss of life and harm to those that um, work uh, with those that are, have the severe sentences. And lastly, Judge, I just wanna make one quick point to um, the, the affirmative uh, weighing mechanism clearly states that if the negative negation is able to prove that abolishing the death penalty would negatively impact society, that they should lose. And clearly having our more, more prisons and having dangerous prisons would be negatively impacting society along with judge that if we, we reduce the rigor in those cases. So I think simply put, the case today is in favor of the negation. Thank you. And thank you very much for that speech, Joshua. And finally, without further ado, we will turn the floor back over to the affirmative one final time. This is the affirmative rebuttal and, or excuse me, the second affirmative rebuttal and summary speech. You get three minutes for this speech, but again, start us off with a quick off time roadmap. And remember, it's the last speech of the debate, so make your case. Yeah, so just to begin on a quick off time roadmap, I will begin with the on case argument. So going over advantage one, wrongful executions, and advantage two, costly financial burden. Then I'll go ahead and switch over to the off case argument. So disadvantage one about prison safety, and then ultimately uh, go to the top of case. That being said, is Ryan, you said he was ready. Uh, negation, are you ready? Beautiful. And go ahead and assume those individuals at home are ready as well. That being said, I have three minutes and my time is starting now. So as my last and the last speech of the debate, I just want to say thank you for everybody at home for watching in on this truly explore, uh, truly amazing debate. That being said, thank you to Josh for being here. Thank you to Ryan. Thank you for everybody at home. That being said, jumping right into uh, advantage one, wrongful executions. So the point that I really want to make here is that through abolishing, we can eliminate these wrongful executions. This is something that is granted and accepted by the negation. Also, with these improved testings that these negation is making, we can can lessen the wrongful convictions. Therefore, we are receiving the best of both worlds from a um, from a execution and conviction perspective, thus benefiting our society through the weighing mechanism of net benefits. We are benefiting these wrongful executions and these individuals who were wrongfully convicted. Going on to advantage two, costly financial burden. The negation challenges the impact that I gave in my first speech. However, this is what we call an argument that has been dropped. Whenever an individual in debate makes an argument, the other 
side has to respond to it and the argument immediately proceeding. If they don't, it is otherwise not addressed and therefore the reputation is not valid. Therefore, all the reputation that the nation did make on my second impact does not hold any validity within the case of this debate. So otherwise it can be, it can be considered as not said at all. Going on to the first disadvantage of, 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 this, of prison safety, the only disadvantage that the nation makes, the fact of the matter is that this advantage is directly as a result of overcrowding as little do, a little to do with death row inmates. Therefore, it has very little effect. The negative additionally stated within the cross-examination, there are minimal death row inmates. Minimal amounts of individuals cannot make these truly explo uh, explosive impacts and effects that the negation claims to make. These severe effects are significant but they are not significant to the resolution of uh, the death penalty with death row inmates. The death penalty, again, does not uniquely make it less safe and there's otherwise, again, no real disadvantage. Going back to the top of case, the negation mentions how we still have the death penalty, but it causes me to reiterate on the cross-examination I asked within, um, when regards to progression. So we have to ask ourselves, what is keeping America from making this progressive change? I argue that it is not these deteriorating prison conditions of the negation wants you to believe. However, we can rely on the impacts for knowing why we should make this beneficial change. One, death is permanent, especially for these who are wrongfully convicted. These are leaving the guilty parties free of any form of punishment, leaving them unchecked, when in reality, those who are innocent are suffering. Going on to the next impact, avoiding a financial collapse. We can redistribute this money in other ways. And these ways are ways in which I reiterated within my case. We can see that they are going to be, they can be used potentially to allocate towards better policing schools and infrastructure, especially where we live in the San Luis County. We can see that it is of uttermost importance. So going back to the weighing mechanism of today's debate net benefits, I not only have two relatively untouched advantages, but, it, uh, but I also successfully countered every single aspect of the disadvantage as well, proving that the death penalty should be abolished. And with that, it brings our debate to a close. I want to extend a huge round of thank yous to both of our debaters for bringing such a educational and exciting debate to our audience to evaluate. Ultimately now, the decision lies with you, the audience members, about who you think won this debate. And so we'll let you mull over, uh, over that. I appreciate, I appreciate you all tuning in and watching this live performance of Speech Night. Thanks as always for your support and good night. Thanks for joining us. If this looks like an activity you might enjoy, check out COM 105 Intercollegiate Speech and Debate on PiratesNet. Register for the spring. We'd love to have you join us.